Hey everyone, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center. I was just telling Secretary Moniz that we could rename this event the Rockstar Returns. <laughs> I was watching him walk down the hall and he was greeted by all kinds of people uh, from here and from his former lives. And uh, uh, it's just a real pleasure uh, to welcome him back for his third tour at the Wilson Center. He's a great friend to our work, and he's uh, spoken to us in the past about science in the Amazon, American energy policy, and today he'll focus on the Iran deal and other nuclear challenges. We have many of our nearest and dearest supporters and leaders from the Wilson Center in the front row, and I believe the ambassador of Iraq is also here. There you are, welcome, sir. Um, as you all know, Ernie Moniz is a deep thinker with a broad portfolio. A scholar and a public servant who does our namesake, Woodrow Wilson, proud. And while you don't have to be a nuclear physicist to understand the Iran nuclear deal, it definitely helps. As I've said before, uh, if I were still in Congress, where I served for nine terms, I would have voted for the deal. But the movie isn't over yet. Rob Litvak, our Vice President uh, for Scholars, who's sitting in the front row, and who himself is one of uh, the top experts on this issue, uh, writes that the deal is transactional, not transformational. It's an arms control deal, in other words, not a grand bargain. And there are still many nuclear question marks out there. Are we certain, uh, Secretary Moniz, that we'll know if Iran cheats? If they try, uh, and if we have evidence that they are trying, Will, will we, the U.S. government, especially you, be able to convince Europe, which is now getting hooked on uh, trade with Iran, uh, that we have a smoking gun? On top of that, uh, what about other nuclear challenges uh, way beyond Tehran? As the head of the Department of Energy, uh, Secretary Moniz manages our nuclear arsenal, leads our most sensitive nuclear research, and pioneers the use of new technologies in other energy sectors. Uh, all of this will come up in our conversation today. So I'm not sure what keeps you up at night, but here are a couple of things that keep me up at night. I think about, in addition to Iran, North Korea, which claims to have tested a hydrogen bomb. I worry about Pakistan, with an arsenal of more than 100 nukes and an intelligence service that has been known to play both sides on the, in the war on terror. Could the Taliban get its hands on some of that material? Could ISIL? To quote Jack, the late great Jack Valenti, whom many of you probably knew, uh, I sleep better at night knowing that Ernie Moniz, a brilliant scientist and dedicated public servant, is on the case. He's one of this country's most accomplished physicists with a doctorate from Stanford and decades of experience on the faculty at MIT where he served as head of the Department of Physics. And he's taken all that brain power into public service, first as uh, the Clinton administration's, uh, uh, in the uh, Clinton administration's Office of Science and Technology Policy, then as Under Secretary of Energy in that administration, and now as the President Obama's Secretary of Energy since 2013. <coughs> he has this uncanny ability to translate scientific material into language that even recovering <coughs> politicians can understand. He's clear, he's reassuring, and many of my friends on the Hill tell me uh, that the Iran agreement would not have survived but for his reassuring pitch. In the Iran talks, he was America's secret weapon. So now please join me in welcoming uh, one of the Wilson Center's greatest uh, re repeaters, uh, <laughs> Secretary Ernie Moniz. Over the top. So Over the top. <laughs> <laughs> Over the top. Well, thanks, Jane. Uh, uh, as, as you said, uh, uh, actually, well, I would add that the Wilson Center is one of the uh, great places to come to precisely because it's a place where I can actually discuss all the diverse missions of the Department of Energy. Uh, you mentioned science and uh, what we did with Brazil and the Amazon and Paulo here someplace and uh, then Jan and, uh, and energy and uh, now, of course, on, on our security agenda, something that Jane has had a little bit of experience in uh, for some time. Of course, she's also a fabulous bait-and-switcher 
Uh, would you come here and talk a little bit about uh, where we stand on implementing the Iran deal? Uh, oh, and by the way, let's do North Korea, the <laughs> Taliban, uh, nuclear deterrence, uh, and a few well, other issues. You but, can come uh, back and, we can. and do more. Th that's why we have Q&A. That's right. Uh, so um, let me, uh, 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 today, what we're going to focus on is basically nuclear materials. Uh, uh, and uh, I would just put that in the context that uh, President Obama, uh, this group is very knowledgeable, knows that already in April of 2009 in, in the Prague agenda laid out a broad nuclear agenda with a very, very strong focus on kind of reviving uh, really uh, uh, our, our programs, our actions in terms of controlling, eliminating whenever possible uh, nuclear uh, uh, materials uh, of risk. Uh, and I'm going to end up today uh, by uh, conjuring up the nuclear security summit that we have coming up mm. uh, at the end of next month, um, uh, leading in turn, by the way, to the IAEA's second triannual uh, nuclear security uh, ministerial. Um, and so uh, going from April 2009 to December um, 2016, I want to emphasize this is really going to be eight years of really having um, the nuclear material issue a very, very strong focus of this administration. Now, of course, uh, there was the, I would say, presumably unanticipated uh, in 2009, uh, the, uh, the Iran uh, focus. Uh, which, uh, again, I remind you, it's, which was fundamentally uh, a discussion about nuclear materials uh, and, of course, about the technologies that could uh, make those uh, materials weapons usable, uh, whether it's uh, high-enriched uranium or, or, uh, or, or plutonium. But uh, when it comes around to these issues, uh, it's, roughly speaking, it always comes back to the availability of nuclear materials and the risks <laughs> that they can, that they can uh, pose. Uh, I, I would note that, uh, uh, because it's a particular favorite of mine, uh, that, uh, again, in this, in this uh, focused administration, one of, the, uh, one of the really major events was not the initiation, but the conclusion of the HEU deal with Russia. That was the end of 2013, uh, the so-called megatons to megawatts um, uh, uh, program. Uh, 500 tons of, of HEU uh, blended down uh, into a nuclear reactor, uh, commercial nuclear reactor fuel. And I just uh, kind of conjure that up again because, well, first of all, I think certainly it's, it goes down as one of the absolutely great nonproliferation uh, programs. But I would just note that um, uh, in my uh, first go around the track uh, at DOE uh, in the Clinton administration, uh, we had a science-based negotiation to put that deal back on track in 1999. It had fallen off the rails, uh, and we did that. And I just raise that now from the point of view that it was kind of maybe a practice run for science-based negotiation uh, at trying to, uh, trying to address uh, some of these critical nuclear materials uh, problems. Well, OK, so let's turn to Iran and kind of an update uh, on the JCPOA. Uh, we're just over two weeks past uh, implementation day, uh, which by uh, definition is the day on which the IAEA certified that Iran had met the conditions uh, laid down uh, in the JC, JCPOA. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, our, the science-based focus, I would just note that um, basically, uh, you know, the, the negotiations uh, clearly uh, we're having a hard time uh, 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 making a substantial progress. And I want to say that uh, I think that that is to a large extent because uh, when you think about it, uh, obviously it was kind of a, on the one hand, a s uh, the negotiation was about a substantial rollback of Iran's nuclear program in return for the relief of, uh, of sanctions, of a certain class of sanctions at least. So on the Iranian side, um, the nuclear program was the, uh, the giver. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and frankly, I think without having uh, Mr. Salehi, uh, head of that program, a former foreign minister, a vice president uh, of, of, of Iran, 
without having him directly involved, it was just going to be very, very difficult to, to define the parameters of that, of that nuclear rollback. And so it was really in recognition of that uh, that he and I were uh, put into the negotiation to, to really focus on the nuclear dimensions uh, and how we would uh, uh, have a substantial rollback, accomplish the fundamental objectives laid down by President Obama uh, while uh, preserving the essentials uh, as required by Iran's uh, supreme leader and, uh, and President Rouhani. So that was really the dynamic that led to this rather unusual situation in which uh, on our side, Secretary Kerry and I uh, were negotiating these tracks and on their side, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif and, uh, and Mr. Mr. Salehi. I want to emphasize, however, I've done this many times, but I never want to forget to say that um, uh, clearly when Salehi and I were put into the negotiation, the science component uh, received a lot more public attention, but the Department of Energy, its national laboratories, which are an incredible resource of nuclear knowledge, nuclear science, nuclear technology, I want to make it very clear, they were involved throughout all the negotiations the entire time uh, providing the technical underpinning. It was just that when, the, when this got elevated to kind of a direct negotiation uh, that it became more public. But I just want to say that we had, uh, it's, it's, it became public, we had seven national laboratories and two additional nuclear sites involved in the negotiation throughout its entirety, uh, providing the analysis. And I should say right now, uh, they will continue to be involved uh, in this period now of, of implementation and, uh, and verification, certainly supporting the IAEA uh, in, its, uh, in its jobs. So let me, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, again, just bring up to date, I think, you know, I'll, I'll be saying things which to many of you are familiar, but just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what it is that Iran had to do and did do uh, uh, with a little extra color uh, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, meeting the JCPOA requirements. Um, plutonium, HEU, the two <laughs> fundamental materials uh, under discussion. Um, we sometimes forget uh, because of the tremendous focus on you know, centrifuges and making HEU that actually the plutonium pathway is one that really uh, dominated the discussion for, for quite a long time. Uh, the issue of a uh, reactor called Iraq, A-R-A-K. Um, uh, it sounds too much like Iraq. Uh, the, the, uh, the Iraq reactor uh, was one of major concern uh, uh, because it, uh, was, it would be a, in its design, a, a prolific, a heavy water reactor would be a prolific uh, producer of plutonium. Uh, let's just say in the one to two weapons worth uh, per year. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of concern about uh, that reactor going hot uh, because without getting into too much detail, going hot uh, could um, limit uh, certain options uh, in terms of addressing uh, its plutonium production. So in this agreement, plutonium pathway is, uh, is, is blocked through a number of measures, most specifically the uh, Calandria, a core of that reactor, uh, has been pulled out of the reactor and filled with concrete. Uh, it is uh, uh, permanently out of uh, commission. It is to be replaced through some international collaboration. Iran is responsible. I mean, Iran has to <laughs> be the project manager, if you like, and build a replacement reactor, but they will do so with the, uh, the help of uh, the international community and specifically the United States and China uh, are co-chairing a technical working group that will um, work on verification of design of a new reactor aimed at meeting certain parameters. Those parameters include an order of magnitude <coughs> reduction uh, in uh, plutonium production uh, uh, to effectively not make it a practical uh, pathway. 
it actually will increase <laughs> the, uh, the uh, reactor's capacity for some fundamental research. But the key for us in nonproliferation is that uh, it is a dramatically reduced uh, uh, plutonium production, way below a significant quantity uh, in its annual production. But of course, there are other features as well. Mm. That's a Geiger counter, and uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, the uh, so Iran. I'll just keep talking. Keep talking. Um, Iran uh, will has furthermore committed to send uh, the fuel, spent fuel from that reactor, uh, out of the country uh, for its lifetime. It has committed to uh, no additional heavy water reactors. Uh, for 15 years with a, an additional statement that it is not their intent to actually go back to a heavy water reactor, uh, although the option is preserved uh, after, after 15 years. No, no, I don't have my cell phone. They're, they're in the car. Um, <laughs> it's mine. But Jane has her cell phone. I know, but it's off. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. That's the... Um, no, mine's off. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, they have uh, agreed to cap their heavy water inventory uh, uh, at a level required to service the new reactor uh, 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 design, which, as I said, is is uh, is. Check. Uh, sorry. So we'll turn the other one off. This is a test, Ernie. This we is. Not on. I did. It's off. But that's not off, Jane. Well, okay. Well, let's, let's carry on. In any case, <laughs> so as I said, uh, uh, there. So there, there. All of these. Uh, all of these components. Uh, in terms of fundamental redesign of the reactor, uh, uh, spent fuel storage uh, sent out of the country, uh, no additional heavy water reactors, uh, uh, heavy water uh, limitations. Uh, and I would just say that on the heavy water limitations, there is a certain uh, analogy to that HEU deal, the megatons to megawatts deal, in the sense that uh, those materials that have been of concern, uh, the, all of the excess will uh, go into, uh, on commercial terms, go into benign use, uh, utilization uh, in research, in, uh, in, uh, in, in industrial processing, uh, in the whole set of uses for, 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 uh, for heavy water. So that, uh, that, uh, all of that's been done, as I said, and the IAEA uh, certainly has verified uh, the steps up to now, uh, uh, including uh, Iran sending of, it, of its additional uh, its surplus heavy water uh, outside of, uh, of, of Iran uh, already, not to mention the concrete in the uh, Calandria. Uh, on uranium, uh, HEU, of course, the issue was the two enrichment sites at Natanz and, uh, and, and Fordo. Uh, and as you know, they had, um, uh, they had built up to nearly 20,000 centrifuges. They had um, uh, stockpile of about 300 kilograms of roughly 20 percent uh, enriched uranium uh, and uh, uh, about 12 tons of low enriched uh, uh, uranium, the, um, uh, typically around 4.5 to 5, 5 percent uh, uh, enrichment. The, I think you all know the story that the number of centrifuges uh, that will uh, enrich, and again, I want to emphasize this has been done. Uh, 
Uh, they are down to roughly 5,000, just over 5,000 uh, operating centrifuges. But I want to add that not only were the other centrifuges removed, so was infrastructure feeding the centrifuges uh, 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 removed. And very importantly, and something that does not get, frankly, enough attention because it is core to the agreement, is a 15-year commitment to no more than 300 kilograms of 3.67 percent enriched uranium. You may ask why 3.67. It turns out that is the lowest assay fuel in part of a Bouchier core. Uh, and 300 kilograms is not much more than a kind of a working inventory to maintain their much lower program. It, in and of itself, contributes the majority of the increase of the so-called breakout time from just over two months to a minimum of a year in terms of the time it would take Iran, if it chose to break out, to assemble the high enriched uranium for a single nuclear explosive. That restriction on the inventory is absolutely central, and as I say, it alone accomplishes uh, a majority of that extension of the breakout time. That has been verified by the IAEA. And here, I mentioned earlier how we were collaborating with China in terms of the Iraq uh, uh, redesign. I want to emphasize the, ex the amount of international, uh, uh, the degree of uh, and nature of international collaboration uh, to accomplish our objectives has been really outstanding. Uh, it goes without saying that this was a P5 plus one plus EU negotiation in the first place. And the coherence of the, of the P5 plus one in the EU is itself a remarkable story. It's not as though there aren't some differences of opinion among those groups on a variety of issues. And yet, totally together in terms of negotiating this deal. Well, I could argue one little exception, but, but, uh, but fundamentally, uh, incredible coherence. But in the implementation, uh, the, we, again, we had the China story. Here, in this question of Iran, in a, a remarkably short time, and I'll be, tr I'll be straightforward, a significantly shorter time than I thought was going to be possible, uh, reaching the requirements required a lot of cooperation. In this case, Russia, probably first among equals in terms of that cooperation, in terms of not only removing, uh, again, most of those thousands and thousands of kilograms of low-enriched uranium, of removing 20 percent uranium, of removing some scrap materials for which, you know, not a very attractive prospect, but they put it all on a ship and they moved it out. Very big contribution. But that wasn't enough. Without going into all the details, there was, uh, uh, this again conjures up the megatons to megawatts deal for the aficionados in the house. There was a natural uranium component that had to be addressed. Norway stepped up, Kazakhstan stepped up, Azerbaijan stepped up uh, to all make this thing happen uh, in a very, very compressed uh, uh, time scale. So it really, really quite extraordinary. And again, uh, all of this has happened. Finally, uh, the covert concerns. So HEU and plutonium are clearly the pathways, uh, but uh, uh, what I've talked about so far is addressing the program that would be remaining as part of a buildup of civilian nuclear capacity. Uh, but obviously the concern is uh, also that there could be a, a covert activity. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the uh, previous military dimensions. We can discuss it later if, if you wish. Uh, but the issue is going forward, uh, uh, what can we do on the covert uh, side? I want to emphasize that despite what is said in some quarters, the agreement is unique and breaks new ground in terms of nonproliferation uh, requirements. 
One bit of new ground is that uh, Iran, well, Iran has already now into compliance, and it's not ratified yet, but into compliance with the additional protocol, which, as you know, is the basis for access to undeclared sites uh, that are suspicious. Uh, however, for the first time, there is a finite time of response to an IAEA uh, request uh, for access to any site that, uh, for which there are grounds to, to suspect uh, unallowed activity. It's 24 days uh, is the maximum time clock. Uh, we are extremely confident about our ability to uh, detect uh, the use of, uh, particularly of uranium. Uh, in, in, in facilities, but again, just having a time clock is itself uh, a, a first. Uh, there'll be a procurement working group uh, through which Iran must go for, for, uh, for its purchases. There are new, not only quantitatively new, but qualitatively new elements, such as a 25-year verification of the uranium supply chain. There is, for the first time, not only a commitment, which all NPT signatories have, to not pursuing a nuclear weapon, but for the first time, forever, there's a commitment to not pursuing weaponization activities. Things like explosively driven neutron generators. You can imagine why that might be useful in one context. Uh, Multi-point initiation of explosives, etc. And for 15 years, no work uh, with uh, uranium metal. So these are really new steps that have, that have been taken. And uh, there are others, such as they're not, which are not new in the international context, but new in this context. For example, allowing the IAEA to use advanced technologies, and that's already happened. Electronic seals are in place, uh, wired up to, uh, to central uh, data collection uh, systems uh, for, the, for the IAEA. As you can imagine, the IAEA has been handed an enormous new responsibility, uh, like 25 years of verifying a uranium supply chain, but these are all in place uh, and moving forward. So it's a pretty remarkable, pretty remarkable story, uh, and certainly it will take the support uh, of the IAEA in getting that done. I mentioned that earlier. That will be financial support. Uh, it will also be the kind of support that we will continue to offer in terms of our, for example, our laboratory capabilities uh, in terms of new technologies and, and, and the deployment of, of, of technologies. So. Finally, uh, so that's, that's this, I think, what I would stop with in terms of Iran. I'll just say a few words, uh, since uh, Jane invited a broader discussion, uh, that um, on, on the nuclear materials uh, side, um, uh, again, the job is not over, and I don't mean just Iran. Uh, uh, one thing that might be of interest, and I won't go into great detail, but, but last week, in the run-up to the Nuclear Security Summit, at the end of March, March 31st, April 1st, uh, we held at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, one of our weapons labs, we held a, a scenario-based exercise with 37 countries, many at the ministerial level, and key international organizations like the IAEA, like Interpol, going through a scenario of HEU falling into terrorist hands, and what do you do? It was very interesting. Uh, on the one hand, we had a pre-meeting in which the delegations had a chance to go around and see some of the technologies at Livermore that we use here. For example, uh, nuclear forensics, a key issue in... Um, in this kind of an event. Needless to say, international capabilities in something like that are highly variable. So one of the lessons that came out for sure is what kind of international cooperation, how do international organizations work on this. 
uh, in, in the case of an, of an event. But we also had, you know, as these, these exercises always point out, for example, I'll stay with forensics, talk about the United States. In a forensics examination, we can get some information very quickly, but a real to get the full information takes weeks. Weeks may be a great laboratory time scale. It may not be a senior official decisional time scale. So how do you manage the mismatches between that? How do you manage public acceptance? So this was a this was, I say, a big deal uh, and a remarkable exercise uh, with tremendous participation. And this is a prelude, as I say, uh, to the nuclear security summit uh, that will come will be coming up uh, and uh, in the March. Uh, and um, and um, uh, which will continue uh, the issues around the success that we've had uh, working with other countries in terms of removing weapons usable materials uh, from across the board. Now, that is the end of my uh, uh, remarks, um, uh, except that uh, you mentioned transactional versus transformational, mm -hmm. and. Um, Maybe I'll just conclude with a comment that um, I believe that is the correct characterization today. The question is, will it remain that way? Which is okay, a lot of progress. But I, don't, I also don't think we should at least, we should blunt our hopes and aspirations that it will grow into something that is transformational in terms of relationships uh, in, in the region, relationships with us. And ironically, I would say, the more the implementation of the agreement is transactional, the better chance we have for it to become transformational. Thank you. Okay, so apparently an AMP failed. It wasn't a Geiger counter. And our Secretary of Energy was cool as a cucumber. So this is a first test. Uh, that's, because I've, that's because I've been irradiated so much already. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let me ask a few questions. We have about 25 minutes remaining, and we do want to get to audience uh, questions. I thought your ending on a hopeful note was, was extremely useful. Uh, one of the other points that Rob Litvak makes is that because it is a transactional agreement, uh, assuming it works, and that was the implication of your comment, it also frees us to focus on Iran's other bad behavior uh, in the short term, which is continuing. Uh, one of the aspects of that was the development uh, testing of missiles, and other is the use of terror proxy, terror proxy groups in the region. I know some of this is outside your jurisdiction, uh, but the hope is that uh, we will now be able to uh, confront Iran in all its parts, including hopefully some better parts, uh, maybe in Syria as part of a, a political process. So I just wanted to add that, uh, and that there is some reason to hope, uh, while being very clear-eyed, mistrust and verify, <laughs> there is some reason to hope that in the end uh, this, this agreement will be the beginning of a transformational process. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you meant. Yeah, and I would just add, Jane, that uh, although uh, not some of it, all of it is outside of my uh, 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 jurisdiction, to use your word. But, but nevertheless, let me just say, obviously, this was a major part of the discussions that, right. you know, on the on the side, uh, the agreement was focused, very clearly focused. Uh, but uh, uh, right through the through the negotiation and following it, uh, we have certainly done all that we can to amp up the discussion with our Gulf partners and with Israel. Uh, about uh, sh strengthened uh, strengthened security arrangements, right? Uh, and uh, those are to confront the uh, uh, behavior, the destabilizing uh, behavior that we see, uh, um, you know, ir Iranian support for. So uh, we agree. It's uh, that let's get the nuclear weapon off the table, uh, and then kind of double down on the additional security uh, relationships. Well, just a couple of questions on the deal and on the, your, some of your broader s jurisdiction. First, on the deal, I mentioned in my opening comments that if Iran cheats, and I know you said we're going to have very good information about whether that is happening, uh, my question is, if Iran cheats, 
do you think we'll be able to put the P5 plus one back together in sufficient form to go to the UN to uh, seek imposition of the snapback, the reimposition of sanctions, after most of those countries have been engaged in robust trade with, the, with Iran, which is now happening? Well, first of all, let me um, disagree with the last statement um, in the terms of is happening. There is some happening, clearly, uh, but we should not get too carried away. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of probing, a lot of discussing, uh, but also a lot of apprehension. Uh, and, uh, and we should remember Iran remains a heavily sanctioned country. Right. Nuclear sanctions were removed, not those associated with the other elements that you described earlier. Inevitably, some entities may have been <laughs> desanctioned for one reason, but remain under some sanctions. Uh, the, uh, so I think business, uh, clearly, uh, there is a lot of, uh, why, I mean, frankly, why wouldn't there be a country of almost 80 million people, uh, you know, significant economy, uh, especially now in the, in the new, in the new, uh, new uh, arrangement. But they also go into this with, have to go into the, with, you know, with eyes wide open in terms of snapback possibilities, uh, uh, et cetera. And to make it very clear, there is no, there will be no grandfathering of, you know, capital investments uh, if there is a, uh, a snapback. Now, uh, I personally am, you know, reasonably optimistic that that the agreement will be adhered to um, uh, for, you know, for its, for its duration, but that's what we have to pay attention to. Uh, now, in terms of the coherence, again, I'll just say, uh, obviously, it's always hard to know uh, completely, but the fact is the P5 plus one coherence in the negotiation showed a common interest in the nonproliferation objectives of this discussion, uh, a common understanding that Iran with a nuclear weapon uh, was not in any of our interests. Uh, and, um, and all I can say is the fact that, uh, that we got there, and if we all do our parts honestly and Iran violates the agreement, we at least, ha we certainly have the best basis we could expect for, uh, for having a, uh, a, a complete response. Actually, I should add one other thing. I remind you that the snapback provisions are written in a very unusual way in which one country can affect it. Uh, um, so we are not subject to a, to a veto on that. So the sanctions would be reinstored, would be restored the issue then becomes compliance with the sanctions mm -hmm. because the sanctions effectiveness clearly came when all the countries of the world, even those beyond the P5 plus one, took part. India, you know, Japan, uh, in terms of oil, oil, uh, oil revenues and, and the like. So anyway, I think we're, we're as well positioned as we could be through this, through this diplomatic, uh, diplomatic approach. Uh, well, I think that's a fair point, but, it, but it's worth pointing out that of the sanctions that remain, many of them are U.S. unilateral sanctions. I don't know whether they're, all of them they're, are. No, they're not all. No, they're, they're, they're remain, there them. remain U.N. sanctions uh, 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 with missiles, et cetera, and this mm -hmm. may be an interesting uh, challenge. Uh, it, right. yeah. mm -hmm. We did, of course, put some sanctions on the last missile tests. Okay, a couple of other questions on, in the broader area, and uh, I'm sure the audience will have more on the Iran deal. Um, North Korea, you cited, uh, Ernie, a, a good record by this administration, eight years of focus on the nuclear issue. But some allege that that focus did not include North Korea and that North Korea, a rogue and very unpredictable place, is sort of still uh, unfortunately free uh, to act independent of uh, world opinion and remains a great threat. Uh, this recent nuclear test, whether it was uh, uh, wha wha whatever form of, of, of test it was, and I know that's subject to dispute, is still reason for concern and its ongoing threats to South Korea and us uh, and its tests of long-range missiles are of great concern. So my question is what, or my, my I'm asking you, 
Uh, did the administration take its eye off North Korea, and are we paying a heavy price for that? That is certainly not in my jurisdiction. <laughs> the, uh, but I would just, I mean, obviously we are, uh, we have uh, interest in that, uh, given our mm -hmm. nuclear uh, expertise. Uh, 